Good. Welcome, everyone, to uh, to the get together with Zora Kovacic. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Zora. We've worked as uh, colleagues before. I'm impressed by the remarkable range of her work, and I'm going to ask her to to say something about it before you go into um, your talk today, Zora. But just as a reminder, um, today she's going to focus on complexity, ambiguity, uncertainty in energy transitions in the European Union. And I think uh, this is a really timely topic. We see that there's changes all the time in term, uh, there's a certain direction to energy transition, but there's changes all the time in the modalities. And I think that this, this paper really brings out, for me in a very useful way, what it means to, to take that as a point of departure. How do we deal with knowing um, that uncertainty is and ambiguity that, that these are key characteristics of energy policy making and implementation. And, um, and this is also really germane to a school of thought with which Zora works and with which she engages quite centrally within post-normal science, with understandings that we have to engage with uncertainty and that this engagement itself can be generative and productive if we recognize it. And that has certain implications for how we go about our work as researchers and as part of uh, various epistemic communities. So with that, uh, over to you, Zora, and I'm really looking forward to the talk. Thank you so much, Sid. Uh, well, very briefly, since you asked um, about my, my background. So I, I have worked with post-normal science. Uh, I, I got to know post-normal science when I was doing my PhD. So it's been a few years now that I've been doing research on uh, with this perspective and um, my focus has been very much on understanding uncertainty and complexity which are uh, a part of the talk today uh, and the role that they play in the uh, science policy interface so what happens uh, when scientific evidence is uh, given as advice to policy um, in the context of uncertainty, when this um, information is incomplete or when there is complexity and there are uh, many different types of scientific information that can be taken into account. And I've, so these are my theoretical interests and I've worked quite a bit on energy policies, but also on informal settlements uh, I worked at Stellenbosch University for a bit over a year and, and there I was involved in a project in informal settlements. I worked a little bit in uh, with water policy and yeah, and lately, in the last four years, I was involved in a project on the nexus between water, energy and food and um, so looking also at the interactions between different policy domains and I think more or less, uh, that's what I would add as introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen now and get to the topic for today. And I need to go to the first, okay. Can you see it? Yeah, I'll put it in full screen mode. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, yes, so I, I will give a bit of the theoretical background, which is part of my work and how this applies to energy security governance in the EU. So energy security um, is a concept that is very much character characterized, I would say, but ambiguity. There is this punchline by Paul Joxo, who said that there is one thing that has not changed since the early 1970s. If you cannot think of a reasoned rationale for some policy based on standard economic reasoning, then argue that the policy is necessary to promote energy security. So it seems to be a bit the basket that catches anything. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that energy, the concept of energy security has changed in time, um, with changes also in the in national and international contexts. Um, so this is a term that arised um, in the policy realm very strongly with the oil embargo of the 70s. Uh, 
and security at that point was related to diplomacy and geopolitical concerns and how do we get oil when this comes from a few uh, producers and exporters. Um, also in the 70s, uh, with the publication of the um, uh, work by the Club of Rome on limits to growth, um, another concern arose, which was security against possible oil scarcity or peak oil. Um, because oil uh, was the main, and, and still is, the main source of energy, then um, it became a concern. In the 90s, um, there was a very strongly, especially with the 92 Rio conference, uh, focus on sustainability. And so also security as a sustainability, uh, as in how to make sure the long term, the energy we use can still be used. Um, and then more recently also, and, and linked to this uh, sustainability talk, of course, then the attention goes a bit more into, uh, for example, increasing electricity consumption, which introduces some technical challenges as, for example, securing the grid distribution, um, well, in, in, in different aspects. And, and then in the 2000s, there is sort of, a, again, uh, the focus on geopolitical challenges comes back, especially in Europe, because of the um, relationships with, with Russia. So, is ambiguity an issue? One of the starting points for this work that I did with, with my colleague, Luisa Di Felice, was that we saw very different approaches in academia and in the policy realm. So in academia, uh, in, in the research papers that we looked at, the focus was very much on clarifying ambiguities. And a lot of papers try to provide a definition, a clearer definition or broader definition that is more encompassing or to provide indicators that measure this. And overall, there is this strong um, preference for a holistic view all the things that we need to understand about energy security with the purpose a little bit i would say of trying to speak unambiguously to policy so why is it important to reduce the ambiguity because the idea is that we need to have clear facts unambiguous facts that can be given to the policymaker. but then on the other hand um, in the policy realm we saw that ambiguity it's not necessarily, uh, necessarily a, a problem. There are some scholars that say that ambiguity is a means to reduce conflict and hold together political coalitions. And so you don't necessarily want to reduce it. And in the EU context, we saw that this is uh, very much the case also because different countries have different contexts and needs and uh, completely different energy infrastructures and systems and sources and uh, it's not that easy to define things clearly in a way that doesn't upset anybody so with this with this in mind we started looking at what is ambiguity and uh, we see from the literature that um, it's often defined as a type of uncertainty. When it, we talk about types of uncertainties, this, this uh, has a long tradition of saying and what is uncertainty, there's different um, things that count as uncertainty. So the first the distinction was uh, the one uh, by Frank Knight uh, made back in the 20s and he distinguished between uncertainty and risk, where risk was was quantifiable and uncertainty was not precisely quantifiable. One can think of maybe Bayesian techniques, but it's a little bit of a different type of, type of quantification. So there was something, uh, a type of uncertainty that escapes the precision of science, let's say. And then many scholars built on this, for example, Brian Wynne, who introduces uh, more types of uncertainty. Uh, including ignorance, which is a case when we don't know what we don't know, indeterminacy, which is when uh, system changes are possible and causal chains may be open. So not only there are things that we ignore, but also things may work in a different way. And we particularly were looking at the work of Andy Sterling because he uses, introduces ambiguity as a type of uncertainty, 
in a matrix that relates it also to risk, ignorance, and, and strict uncertainty. I say strict to distinguish it from the more broad notion of uncertainty, right? So the, that's the figure that you see on the, on the right. And the definitions here would be that risk is a situation in which the outcome, the possible outcomes are known and the probabilities associated with all the different outcomes can be calculated. So this is the Knightian type of, of risk. Uncertainty is a situation in which the probabilities associated with the different outcomes cannot be calculated. So there are other ways, maybe interval analysis that can be used to deal with this. Uh, ignorance is where we don't know what the possible outcomes are and we don't know what the, the probabilities are. And then ambiguity in this matrix is about, yes, we can calculate probabilities, but we don't know the possible outcomes. Or we have um, different interpretations, a lot of information about the possible outcomes, and it's not clear which one um, could be expected. Um, so with, with this base, we started thinking of ambiguity as the type of uncertainty that is generated by complexity, because this issue of having multiple representations that are all valid at the same time, but are non-equivalent to each other. And so they don't come together nicely to say, this is what is going to happen. This is typically uh, an issue of complexity. Um, so just very quickly, how do I define complexity? And this is, uh, well, a pedagogic way of, of explaining it, but I think it's quite effective. If we think of a dog, what is a dog? Many different things depending on the, who is defining it. So dog is one thing to the master, a very different thing to the cat, uh, to the worm that lives inside the dog, the dog may be in uh, the environment, to the amoeba that lives inside the worm, the dog is irrelevant, it's just out of context. Um, to the plant, maybe a source of nutrients. Um, to the puppy, a source of life. To a virus, again, completely irrelevant. The virus can live anywhere. It doesn't even know that the amoeba that it's living in is inside the dog. To the nematode that is in the soil, uh, it can be, again, a type of nutrients. And then we can think of a tick, a tree, a bat. Uh, a, a food maker for dogs, an eagle, etc. Oops. So this is just to give a few examples, but the idea here is that when do we start talking about complexity? When we have to think about the coexistence of different scales of analysis. And the different scales we can see, for example, we can have a small scale, such as the one used by the amoeba and the nematode, uh, which are still not equivalent to each other because one is an internal viewer and the other one is an outside viewer. Um, so there is this combination when we think about complexity and, and scales of uh, how the, the granularity, let's say, how fine-grained or coarse-grained something is being analyzed and the point of view of the observer in the system. And all of this give us this, this complexity, this plurality of, of uh, representations that can now be reduced to one another. And this uh, coexistence of multiple representations generates this uncertainty. This, so what is the evidence that we want to use? We don't know. So what we tried to do here was we, we did an analysis of both scientific publications and policy documents that dealt with energy security. Policy documents we focused on in the EU context. And what we were looking at was how the different types of uncertainty were articulated in, the, in these two types of, of literature, let's say. So when for academic articles, we were looking for definitions of energy security. And for the policy documents, we were looking at policy measures that deal with energy security because obviously in the policy this is not necessarily defined. And in both cases, we were looking at what types of uncertainty are explicitly mentioned or uh, where we could see, according to these definitions that we use, that this type of uncertainty was present. Um, so this is an overview of the results from the um, uh, analysis of the academic literature. 
And if there is interest, I can go back to this slide later in the questions. Uh, but but the, I just highlighted a few points to uh, show how really broad the discussion is and really diverse. Um, so there are definitions that relate to technology, uh, to the temporal dimension. There are different logics that some uh, authors speak of, the logic of war of subsistence. Um, there are, well, some people that make distinction between reserves and resources, people that talk about resilience. Um, infrastructure is critical in some cases. Some, some authors talk about societal re resilience and not necessarily resilience of the energy system. Um, well, and you can see many, many dim dimensions are taken into account, so geological, geopolitical, economical, environmental. Um, some authors, is, which was interesting to us, speak about the dysfunctions of the energy system as being critical. So there are also some sort of internal definitions of, of what energy security is about. Um, or they make this, when speaking of the different types of uncertainties and the risks, there are this distinction between specific risks, systematic risks and systemic risks, which was interesting. Or again, uncertainties that come from outside the system. So natural disasters, for example. Um, and of course, also related to imports, to trade. Um, so you, you get more or less an idea, no? And this is one uh, which is interesting too, because we see that a lot, a lot of the literature, again, tries to clarify the ambiguity and come with a very clear definition, which they do, the papers are clear, but again, so broad and so diverse that when you go through the literature, you are still in this, very much in this ambiguity. And then as far as the policy analysis, we, we did two things. One was to look at the uh, policy measures that are in the EU energy security strategy. So these are what we call direct measures because they are explicitly meant for um, to improve energy security. And then we looked at also other measures where energy security is mentioned, but often it, it is mentioned together with other things. So there are measures where the policy says this will be good for sustainability, for economic growth and for energy security, for example. And then we call those the indirect, which come in the next slide. So I'll go back to that later. And uh, there, what I highlighted here was that there is only one instance where we could think that ambiguity could be a problem for policy making, which is this goal of for the European Union to speak with one voice when it comes to external energy policy, so external to the Union. And that's the only case where this plurality of interpretations and voices and what is this about seems to be a problem. And this was interesting because to us, because um, again, uh, it was not anticipated by the, um, by the literature. We, we, expect, we expected ambiguity to have a functional role always. And, and there are some exceptions here. Um, so this is the overview of the indirect uh, measures, which, well, I, I can come back to this later also if, if we want. Uh, with the, in the paper you find the references of where the, which policies this, these are from. So what we see is that uncertainty is very much central to the need for security. So very often when there is a policy um, or, the, or also in the academic literature that deals with energy security, uh, this energy, the energy system or provision or supply or demand or whatever it is, needs to be secured against a risk, a threat or, or something that is uncertain. So this is very, very central. What we saw also is that we have both vagueness and ambiguity, especially in the policy. Actually, the vagueness is probably just in the policy, not necessarily in the, in the academic literature. And, and these are similar, but they're not exactly the same thing. Um, 
so vagueness is often a political decision. Uh, for example, uh, avoiding the explicit mention of some specific countries or regions like mm, the oil providers in the Middle East or Russia when it comes to, to gas um, is something that can be uh, a very uh, like a conscious choice uh, because it helps um, different member states may have different relationships with these countries and so the, the union of the, the, the policy of the union in this case doesn't create a problem for the specific member states. So, but ambiguity is a different thing. Uh, as, we, as I said before, we define this as connected to, to complexity and because it's connected to complexity, it has to do with the incommensurability of the knowledge base, the non-reducibility of these different points of view. And this uh, makes it possible for a plurality of knowledge claims to be taken into account. So this expands the political space. Um, also beyond, for example, the member states that can include the industry, can include um, a variety of actors. And so the ambiguity is not necessarily a political decision, but it has very much to do with how the policy and the politics are done. What we saw also is that um, there are many, many trade-offs. Uh, in these different definitions and and also in in the very much in the policy measures um, which means that there are many different types of security uh, that we find uh, related to technical specifications uh, to the market to the nexus again if securing energy has a spillover effect on food and food security for example on geopolitical security, which I've mentioned many times, on environmental securities, this has to do very much with um, how energy policies relate to climate change concerns, for example, and the uh, transition um, to more sustainable energy systems. Um, and technological, technological security different from technical security. So when I speak about, I refer to technical security, it has to do, for example, with the challenges of the electric grid. Technological security is more about the choice of different technologies, uh, including innovation. Um, or at least this is the way that we distinguished it here. And what we noticed is that often there is a tension between the internal view and the external view. So I'm, I'm referring back to this concept of complexity as the non-equivalent uh, understanding, right, of what secure energy security is, it becomes very clear in this sense, because securing, um, I, I think I have an example. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, for example, smart grids. And to the extent that, you know, according to some authors, the, they contribute to, to energy security, how are they supposed to do so? By collecting information um, about energy consumption and and about the supply and matching this. Um, so at different scales of analysis, the smart grid actually, we saw that it becomes very different things, um, which plays on this duality of what is security. And if we're securing internally, we may be creating problems externally. So at the, at the smaller scale of analysis, when we think of um, the end users of electricity, uh, what, what is a smart grid? It's about the smart meters. Uh, so the collection of information about uh, end users and when electricity is uh, used and uh, with the idea of trying to modulate energy demand. Um, and this may have uh, a concern in policy when it comes to privacy. When we look at the, the mesoscale of analysis, we're looking at distribution. So how uh, the end users, how the distribution system matches supply with, with demand. And in this case, the smart grid has the goal of integrating better the mix of end users with the available supply of electricity in the grid, which becomes very critical with the introduction of some energy electricity sources that are intermittent as can be uh, 
uh, solar energy or energy from wind farms um, where the production may not be, the supply may not be predictable. Um, and so there is a big challenge when integrated some of the renewable energies in, uh, with, uh, with um, the stability of the grid. And this is a completely different way of, of looking at how this impacts energy security. And often here, the smart grid is used as a means of uh, being more efficient, you know, avoiding waste. When, when, if we know when things are going to be on demand and when things are going to be supplied, then all this information is supposed to help manage things better. And then finally, the, the largest scale of analysis um, we may take into account also the production of energy where, this, where electricity in this case comes from and it can come from renewable but also non-renewable and fossil um, energy sources. It passes the primary energy sources. And, and in this case, the role that can be attributed to smart grids is that of is in the transition to renewable energy sources. And then here we're talking about the performance of the overall system. Uh, and this may or may not be compatible with needs at the smaller scale, like accessibility and price uh, for consumers. So there, I'm, I'm giving this example of how representations and understandings change at the different scales of analysis, because this is very much part of the difficulty. Of, of giving this one and precise definition of I mean, energy security. Um, so in terms of governance, there are two, uh, the, there, the point that I want to make is that <clears throat> these different types of uncertainty, they impact governance very differently. <clears throat> so generally speaking, when we speak of uncertainty, we think of wanting to reduce it. Uh, why? Because um, often the model uh, that we use to think about the science policy interface is that we need to get the facts and then we can act. So if we reduce the uncertainty, we have more precise facts and these facts will indicate what to do, uh, what, how to design the policy and we not allow for action. This is an ideal model. Mm, a little bit problematic because we can argue, and this is one of the points of post normal science, that the facts are never certain. And so we should just learn to deal with the uncertainty and let go of this ideal of the get the facts and act model and look for more realistic, maybe, types of ways of thinking about the science policy interface. But this is still one, one way of dealing with the uncertainty. Uh, now, when it comes to ambiguity, um, the name of the game is quite different. And maybe the goal here, or there isn't such a need to reduce the ambiguity, maybe we want to keep it. Um, why? Because as we saw before, the ambiguity may allow for different interpretations of the same concept, which means that it makes, this makes it easier for political alliances to be built. So this is a very different model of science policy interface, which is more about the real politic and understanding how uh, scientific advice that um, doesn't serve the political context may be ignored, for example. And so, uh, well, and this can be good or can be bad. We can have different opinions about this, but it's just a very different relationship between science and policy. Um, so what we see is that the recurrent reference that we find in the policies to risks, threats, urgency, and inconsistencies uh, or different trade-offs that uh, arise from the different policy measures that are taken uh, about energy security, they are very useful because every time that there is a risk or a threat, then the policy for needing energy security is justified. And so this, in this realm, um, there is not necessarily a need to reduce. I mean, the, the, the goal of the policy may be to reduce the risk, but there is no need to conceptualize this differently because this is what provides the rationale for the policy making. And just to conclude, um, one is a question that we can talk about, which is 
could reducing ambiguity make scientific advice less useful to policy? Uh, and if that is the case, I, I, this, this, this is a, I, I want to leave it as a question because I think it's a big discussion. Uh, I, I don't know to what extent um, this, this is maybe a personal choice, right? Do I still say what I think is important to me or do I say what I think is going to be useful in policy so that I can engage and where do I put the line? And I, I think it's a big question. And if you have ideas, we talk about it now in the discussion. Um, but what we do argue in this paper is that understanding how plural and ambiguous uh, the knowledge um, is that is used in the policy processes is necessary to create a more fruitful, fruitful dialogue between science and policy. So whatever your idea of uh, how this interface works between science and policy, uh, we think it's important to to nuance, to understand, for example, how uh, ambiguity is different from other types of uncertainty and what the context is. And then, of course, we can still make the choice of saying, okay, I want to uh, produce as, as best facts as I can, that's fine. But it's, it's, we do think that the dialogue is more fruitful, more productive when the policy context and the role that the uncertainties play in the policy context is also understood. So thank you for your attention. And I, I left my email in case anybody wants to get in touch. Thank you, Zora. Um, we're open for questions and I, I thought I could start us off. See, there's a, a round of applause going around. <laughs> um, so, so I really liked how when you began, you juxtaposed uh, sort of risk and uncertainty and I was struck by um, sort of the use of risk as an opposition to energy security or in relation to it. And I wonder if you could say something about how the way that one would think of risk changes if instead of energy security, we take um, objects of uh, attention like energy poverty or energy justice. And there are also increasingly large um, sets of scholarship around these. Um, and you've, you've shown that you know, security, energy security has several connotations and that the same could be said to be true of these, um, of these other concepts. Is it uh, similarly helpful to think of risk in relation to those? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so I should, um, a little bit, uh, a nuance that I didn't um, um, talk about before. So there are, this is one type of definition of risk that I uh, refer to because it's, um, it's useful, it's part of this um, scholarship that looks at the different types of uncertainties. But of course there is also conception of risk which is more about, um, for example, the hazards, the impacts that this may have. So uh, more how we think of risk maybe uh, in our day-to-day -day life, if something is risky, it's not that I'm calculating probabilities, it's just that I think it may have a negative effect on me. Um, so this should be taken into, into account. I, I, don't, I, I use this definition of risk because, uh, because it allows to speak about the different types of uncertainties. Um, but then in the policy itself, when we find uh, reference to risk. It's not necessarily that definition that we're using. So I, I should have uh, explained this. And um, so in, in the case of energy poverty, uh, for example, um, I mean, of course, there are, there are many risks, right, that are caused by uh, and associated with energy poverty. Um, and sometimes they are even mentioned because some, so in, in this very broad and diverse world of energy security, there's, there is also this issue of accessibility and uh, fighting energy poverty, reducing energy poverty and making sure that, you know, what is security is energy that comes at a price that people can afford. For example, it's, it's very much focused on, on price. So it's not a very broad vision of energy poverty, but there are mentions of something related. Um, 
so what I what I haven't studied, maybe you can tell me, but what we we came to see is that different concepts of risk and uncertainty are very much part of the motivation of why energy security uh, is needed as a policy. And I, in when it comes to, for example, energy poverty or justice, I don't know if this is so central. Um, maybe, maybe you can tell me. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's also it, this is a policy a policy realm that is very. I'm going to say vague, right? Because it, it encompasses both the supply and demand and distribution and many different parts of the energy system. Whereas uh, when we think of energy poverty, I, I don't know if I would say that it directly, directly involves also the supply and um, infrastructure, maybe, well, maybe. Uh, but I don't know how directly it impacts all the different uh, parts of the energy system, so to speak. I, I think it is a it is a challenging question, so I don't know that I can uh, assist fully either. But I think it takes us back to somewhere where you brought us towards the end of your talk, which was that um, ambiguity can sometimes. Uh, not necessarily be helpful, for instance, in coordinating across countries and, and national plans. And I think uh, there there's an in, important distinction with energy poverty, where it, in a sense, needs to be situated within national contexts in ways that are that can be kind of the baseline can be quite different of what the needs are. But at a sort of more meta level of specification, you could still argue for the need to have a coordinated uh, common set of definitions or um, at least uh, sort of abstract understandings of the referent. Thank you. I see a question perhaps from Abe. Um, well, maybe maybe to, to, I was just struck by your last, uh, the question you posed in that sense. And I, I was kind of also thinking in, in what you asked about the, uh, the energy poverty in to which, to which extent or where um, these certain yeah, aspects get politicized and where the political decision uh, comes in in that sense. Uh, do you think that the more you, you kind of uh, foreground that, the more it becomes, some things become more obviously political rather than when you put your facts as a researcher more on the table, then it seems to a certain extent less political or you keep the, 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 yeah, the political aspect in that sense more and more back. And yeah, do you, if that makes sense. To, to phrase it like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's part of the function of speaking of facts and scientific evidence is that the political aspect is less, uh, yeah, it becomes maybe, it goes to the, the second stage, at least figuratively, at least in the, in the performance, right? Um, and in, in, in some, in some ways, this is necessary because so a lot of these policies, um, especially when we start seeing all the contradictions that one policy measure can entail and the trade offs that it generates, uh, we see that it's not, these are difficult decisions to make. So there isn't a policy that just makes energy uh, readily available at a good price and that is sustainable and doesn't destroy the environment, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, so using something that looks like a fact and that can be attributed to science may help justify the decision and make it a little bit less different. Um, so there is, there is a role that science plays in the politics of policy making, uh, which helps make some of these difficult choices and, and creates a different type of negotiation, which maybe is a little bit less about the needs or interests of different participants. And it's more about, well, but this is the fact and this is what works. And in some sense it does always, and in some other sense it doesn't. Thanks. I think that's, uh, yeah, that, that's very, I find it very interesting. And in general, thank you for, for, the, for the presentation there.
I have another question if others are taking time. And, uh, and that is um, when you talk about ambiguity, in a sense, you're arguing for its, its utility. One could say that there's always room for interpretation. And so you're saying to be aware of that, that room. Um, and you know, in, at the same time, if there's strategic room for maneuver, there are power differentials across actors. And so um, I, would, I would push you a bit on where do we set the limitations to ambiguity? Are there, for instance, incumbent um, actors who have very clear interests where they are strategically positioned to use ambiguity in a way that is actually very clear? and uh, that we can already predict. So how can um, energy policy, in a sense, be almost preemptive in, in its ability to respond to those kinds of risks of co-option, where, where we need the room for interpretation to, have, to gain policy traction, to be able to deal with the complexities of real world politics, which are different in different places, and yet to to secure against sort of a completely fluid uh, way of approaching uh, the future? Yeah, that's a very good, very good question. I think a very important one. I don't have an answer for you, but I think you, you put your finger on, on something that is very important, which is that, uh, yes, of course, so ambiguity has a role because it allows for the policy process not to get stuck. Uh, but at the same time, it means that we are opening the door or not opening the door, it's just there anyways, to this power differentials, as you say. And um, and this is not part of the, of the paper that we did, but I think that's possibly a um, research question to add to this. Uh, and may, maybe for future research to look at the different definitions that are being used in the, in European policy, for example, and how they reflect a very specific um, set of power relations, because of course they do. So is this ambiguity stabilizing these power symmetries? Uh, can it challenge it? Um, I, I, I don't know, uh, but, but I do think this is extremely important. Have a a very quiet audience today, a small one. I'm, uh, I'm, I have more questions for you, so we can keep going on if, uh, <laughs> if I'm not taking up others' time. Um, and it, it takes us to complexity. And, uh, and I'd, I'd bring in, um, in sort of a cross-sectoral element there, where when you talk about the different uh, understandings of energy security in the literature, to me, it seems like one way of reading complexity there would be how does how does it cut across not only the energy sector but many others and i know that you've worked also on uh, on nexus thinking and uh, and that so I, I know that you have an answer here that will be very useful um is there is there a particular way that we could approach ambiguity at the intersection of different sectors when we're trying to work towards a goal, whether that's energy security or some other sort of target of energy policy, is it? Is there a rule of thumb on how do we channel um, ambiguity to be useful, to, to be informed by an understanding of, ambigu of, uh, of complexity across sectors? It's not yeah. a very well uh, phrased question. <laughs> well, let's see if I understood it. If not, you repeat it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think this is an interesting, an interesting point to to see the com so the complexity interpretation of ambiguity, right, in the nexus. So I think that part of the the challenge with the with the nexus is that in that case we see something similar to doing interdisciplinarity which is that policymakers from DG Agri all of a sudden start speaking to DG Energy and they realize they speak different languages, which is what happens to <laughs> in academia as well, right? And it's very similar. And um, what does this mean? It means that sometimes terms that are used in one policy domain are, are used also in another with very, very different um, 
meanings and interpretations of, of what this should mean. And it becomes, this is maybe also one instance where ambiguity can become a problem when people talk past each other and when, especially when policies contradict each other. And I think this is part of what has stirred up the interest in, in Nexus, which is the big trend now. I was involved in a project about the Nexus because this is what the, also what the EU is funding, right? And there is increasing the, this, this problem of policies contradicting each other. And so we need to understand things in a more integrated way. So let's talk about the Nexus, which is one way of conceptualizing this need for maybe a more integrated view. Um, and uh, so, so it becomes a problem, and but then again, <laughs> it has a function. So there is, I, I think there is a little bit of the same tension there that when you start going in and clarifying things, um, some DGs will like it and others will not. And some, some doors open and others close. And I say this because in the project that I was involved in, we were doing a lot of engagement with, especially with the commission and the different DGs. And, and this was a recurrent experience of presenting something and having some people very enthusiastic and some people mm, unhappy. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Zora. Let's give it a, give it a moment in case there are any, uh, any pending questions. And if not, then, uh, then I'll just ask you for any closing thoughts? Any, uh, you left us with already a very useful question and reflection at the end of your talk, but if you want to reiterate that or say something else post this discussion. And, uh, and then to thank you for taking the time today and, uh, and being with us and talking us through a really useful paper. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for having me. And it was very, very nice to have this cozy conversation <laughs> with a few of us. Um, I don't know if I have any concluding thoughts. Um, just, um, well, this, these are ongoing themes of my research. And so this is what I presented. Presented is not necessarily my end point, but just where I am at in my thinking. Uh, at this point, which means that if you have thoughts and different experiences, I would like to hear about them. And, and so maybe I'll just close with an invitation to keep in touch. And my baby's waking up, so I'm going to close the mic. <laughs>